Hi everyone. In today's lecture, I will give a brief history of the discovery of DNA and talk about the technologies used for sequencing DNA. The DNA was first discovered in 1869 by Frederick Miche. At a time when the concept of cells was still being debated, Miche's lab was researching the chemical composition of the cell. Miche isolated white blood cells in the pus from infections extracted DNA material, and characterized its chemical composition, finding a unique phosphorus to nitrogen ratio. Even though DNA was discovered as a cellular component, its role in the cell would not be established until mid-1900s. Proteins were believed to be the molecules responsible for heredity. An important step toward discovering DNA as the hereditary material was an experiment reported by Frederick Griffith in 1928. Griffith was studying pneumonia with the hopes of creating a vaccine. He used two strains of Streptococcus pneumonia bacteria to infect mice. The rough strain bacteria was non-virulent and would not kill mice because the mouse's immune system was able to fight it off. The smooth strain bacteria was virulent and would kill the mice. This smooth strain has a sugar-based coat that provides protection from the mouse's immune system. Heat treating the smooth strain bacteria would kill the bacteria and the dead bacteria would no longer be infectious or virulent, so the mouse would live. However, when the heat treated smooth strain bacteria was combined with live rough strain bacteria, the bacteria would become virulent and kill the mice. Griffith concluded that the rough strain bacteria must have picked up something from the remnants of the dead smooth strain cells. He did not really characterize what this material was and called it the transforming principle. In 1944, a group of scientists repeated Griffith's experiment to find out what the transforming principle was. They again killed the smooth strain bacteria with heat treatment and applied different purification methods. For each of the resulting material, they tested whether the material was still able to transform the rough strain bacteria and make it virulent. The material would not lose its transforming ability when proteins or RNAs were removed using digestive enzymes, but it would lose its transforming ability if a DNA digestion enzyme was used. Also, the purified material had similar chemical composition to DNA. All of this was used as a strong evidence for DNA's hereditary role and that the transforming principle was indeed DNA. In 1952, Hershey and Chase performed a more conclusive experiment that showed DNA and not the protein is indeed the hereditary material. At that point, it was known that bacteriophages would inject their genetic material into bacteria. Hershey and Chase wanted to know if this genetic material was protein or DNA. They made use of the fact that phosphorus is present in DNA and not in proteins, and sulfur is present in proteins and not in the DNA. They radioactively labeled one batch of bacteriophages with radioactive phosphorus and another batch with radioactive sulfur. After centrifugation, they found that the pellet, which would contain the contents inside the bacteria, had the radioactive phosphorus, and the supernatant, which would be the things outside the bacteria, contained sulfur. Because the bacteria contained the radioactive phosphorus that came from the phage DNA and not the sulfur that was in the phage proteins, they concluded that the DNA was the genetic material that was transferred from the phage into the bacteria. The following year, in 1953, Watson and Crick discovered the double helical structure of DNA from an X-ray image of DNA. They also came up with adenine to thymine and guanine to cytosine pairing between the two strands of the double helix. From their results, 
they suggested that the complementarity of the DNA double helix forms the basis of how DNA is replicated. Following Watson and Crick's findings, researchers focused on reading the DNA, finding the specific sequence of ACGT nucleotides contained in a DNA molecule. Protein sequencing methods that were available, such as Edmund degradation, relied on removing one amino acid from the end terminal of the protein, finding out what that amino acid is using chromatography or electrophoresis, and then repeating this for the next N-terminal amino acid. Sequencing by degradation methods used for proteins were not easily applicable to DNA, because DNA is much longer and errors in reading accumulate for each residue. Also, the nucleotides are more difficult to distinguish compared to amino acids. The first studies for reading nucleotide sequences focused on RNA, because purified RNA was more easily available. Microbial ribosomal RNA, transfer RNA, and single-stranded RNA bacteriophages were the first to be studied, because it was easier to isolate them in large quantities. RNA digestion enzymes to cut these RNA molecules at specific sites were also available. The first RNA molecule that was sequenced was the yeast alanine transferase RNA in 1965 by Robert Hawley. He used ribonuclease enzymes to digest the 77 nucleotide long transfer RNA into smaller fragments and identified what these fragments were using ion exchange chromatography and gel electrophoresis. He used these fragments to infer the sequence of the entire molecule. It took about three years to identify the sequence of the 77 nucleotides. In 1970, Wu sequenced the 5' prime end of the bacteriophage lambda DNA. What is special about the bacteriophage lambda DNA is that it has a 5' prime overhang of 12 nucleotides. Wu used the E. coli DNA polymerase enzyme to repair this overhang one nucleotide at a time. In each step, he tried each of the four nucleotides. In each step, he tried each of the four nucleotides one by one to find out which one would be incorporated. Because only one of the four nucleotides will match the complementary strand and will get incorporated, he effectively identified which nucleotide was present on the complementary strand. Repeating this at each position, he was able to identify what each of the 12 nucleotides were. Hawley's method is called sequencing by degradation. We break apart a DNA molecule to find out which nucleotide is present at a position. Wu's method is called sequencing by synthesis. We try to incorporate each of the four nucleotides and see which one gets to be incorporated. The sequencing by degradation and sequencing by synthesis strategies were improved to form the first generation of sequencing methods. Maxim Gilbert method relied on chemical degradation and had a brief popularity before Sanger's chain termination method took over. Maxim Gilbert started with DNA molecules that were radioactively labeled at their 5' prime end so that the resulting fragments can be visualized on a gel. They used four chemicals that could cleave a DNA molecule at certain nucleotides. For example, formic acid could break the DNA at an adenine or guanine nucleotide. When these fragments were run in parallel on a gel, one could deduce the sequence of nucleotides. The sequencing by synthesis strategy was used by Colson and Sanger, where they used primers. A primer is a short sequence that is complementary to a portion of the DNA that is being replicated. A primer acts as a starting point for DNA synthesis. In a way, the primer creates a 5' overhang 
that can be used as template for DNA synthesis. Nucleotides are added to the primer by DNA polymerase enzyme to create a new DNA strand that is complementary to the DNA that is being replicated. Using a primer and adding all four nucleotides to the mix, they produce DNA fragments of varying lengths. They then separated these fragments using polyacrylamide gels, which have better resolution than 2D electrophoresis. By separating these fragments, they in a way produced longer primer nucleotides that can be used as starting points for further synthesis. Using these fragments, they then performed eight parallel synthesis reactions. In four plus reactions, they only used one type of nucleotide, and in four minus reactions, they left out each nucleotide using the remaining three nucleotides. After letting the synthesis reaction take place, they compared the results of plus and minus reactions to see which nucleotide was incorporated. They repeated this for each fragment they had obtained and identified the order of the 48 nucleotides from a bacteriophage DNA. The next major leap in sequencing was developed by Sanger in 1977, where he used special chain terminating nucleotides in the synthesis. The dideoxynucleotides lack a hydroxyl group on their sugar group, so they are unable to form a bond with another nucleotide on their 3' end. Once they are incorporated into a growing chain of DNA molecule, they stop the DNA synthesis. Sanger performed four reactions. Each reaction contained all four types of nucleotides and only one type of each chain terminating nucleotide. The chain terminating nucleotide would get randomly incorporated into some of the DNA molecules during the synthesis reaction, resulting in chain terminated fragments, each ending with a known nucleotide type. When the results of these reactions were separated in parallel on a gel, the sequence of the DNA could be identified. As an example, let's take a look at this gel and try to find out the starting DNA sequence. The chain terminated DNA fragments are loaded from the top side of this gel, which means the smaller molecules would travel farther down. The smallest DNA fragment is in the A column which means it was terminated with an adenine nucleotide. This tells us that adenine is the first nucleotide of the DNA being synthesized. The next smallest molecule is in the T column, which tells us that the next nucleotide must be a thymine. So each fragment tells us what the last nucleotide in that fragment is. The location on the gel tells us how long each fragment is. This fragment right here is one nucleotide long. This fragment right here is two nucleotides long. This fragment right here is three nucleotide long. Of course, each of these fragments would have the primer at the beginning of them. I have used a set of periods to indicate the primer sequence. We can reorder these fragments by their lengths to identify each character of the sequence. DNA sequences are written from 5' prime to 3' prime by convention. Let's make sure we are writing the sequence correctly. It turns out that the DNA is synthesized from 5' prime to 3' prime end as well. So the termination end of each fragment is the 3' prime end. Therefore the sequence that we have written here is in the correct direction. The original sequence used as a template by the DNA polymerase enzyme would be the reverse complement of the sequence. Therefore, this sequence right here would be our original DNA sequence. Over the next several decades, Sanger's chain termination method was improved to make it more accurate and efficient. One improvement was instead of using radioactive labeling, to use fluorescently labeled chain termination nucleotides, 
such that each nucleotide would have a different fluorescent color, which meant that rather than having to run four different reactions using radioactively labeled nucleotides, we can now use one reaction and distinguish the fragments terminated by a different nucleotide on a single electrophoresis lane. The method was further refined by using capillary gel electrophoresis. Capillary gel electrophoresis allowed a larger range of size separation. A laser-based detection of the fluorescence allowed automation. Using multiple lane capillary arrays allowed to perform sequencing of many sequences simultaneously. These improvements allowed automated sequencing of longer fragments up to 1000 nucleotides. The primers can be used to start the synthesis from anywhere on the DNA rather than just from the end of the sequence. When you want to find out the sequence of a DNA molecule that is larger than 1000 nucleotides, you can design primers complementary to various locations on the DNA to initiate the synthesis and consequently the sequencing from that point. Various other sequencing methods have been developed, but Sanger sequencing is still considered a gold standard. One of the main limitations of Sanger sequencing is that it can only be used for sequences up to 1000 nucleotides. The main obstacle for the size limit is that large DNA fragments cannot be accurately separated by their size. Using carefully designed primers, one can work around this size limitation somewhat, but that approach is not sufficient to handle an entire genome. So, if you want to obtain the sequence of an entire chromosome, which can be millions to billions of nucleotides, you have to break it down to short fragments before you can use Sanger sequencing. And that's exactly the strategy used in whole genome shotgun sequencing. Using restriction enzymes, or mechanical force, the DNA is broken into short fragments. These fragments are cloned into a viral vector so they can be amplified. The amplification step makes sure we have sufficient quantities of the DNA fragment and that we can produce more as needed. A vector is a DNA molecule that can be used for carrying foreign DNA. In this case, the foreign DNA is the DNA we would like to sequence. Vectors are routinely used in molecular biology labs to replicate or express a piece of DNA of interest. The term cloning refers to adding our DNA of interest into the vector and transfecting a host cell such as E. coli. The replication and transcription machinery present in E. coli would then replicate or express the vector for us. Plasmids and viral vectors are commonly used as vectors. Plasmids are double-stranded, circular DNA molecules that are capable of replication within bacteria. The plasmid can be cleaved at one of the restriction enzyme sites so that we can insert our DNA fragment there. Plasmids are typically engineered to contain antibiotic resistance genes. After transfecting the bacteria, we can use antibiotics to select the colonies that successfully picked up our cloned DNA. Any bacterial colony that did not pick up our vector would not have resistance to the antibiotics and would not survive. Viral vectors are engineered from existing viruses. Some of their genes are removed to make them non-infectious to make sure they do not have any environmental or health risks. One of the popular vectors is a cosmid vector, which is a vector engineered by combining pieces from a plasmid and the lambda phage. The plasmid component provides the ability to replicate within the bacteria. The lambda phage is a bacterial virus that infects E. coli. 
The cos site of the lambda phage is necessary for packaging the DNA into phage capsids. After the fragments are cloned into vectors, they are amplified and then extracted and sequenced. The short sequence reads we get act like puzzle pieces. We make use of the overlaps among these puzzle pieces to assemble the genome sequence. Solving the puzzle is not easy, and we will talk about the genome assembly in a separate lecture. A variation of shotgun sequencing that you may encounter is paired end sequencing. When we have a DNA molecule to be sequenced, we can use primers to target either of the two strands as template and read the sequence from both ends. The DNA molecule is typically too large, so the mate pairs would not overlap. Even though the paired end sequencing does not read the entire fragment, because we know the fragment size, that helps us identify the relative locations of these puzzle pieces on the genome. A method for overcoming the size limitation of Sanger sequencing is primer walking. In primer walking, we read a sequence from one end, say its first 300 nucleotides. Now that we know the first 300 nucleotides of our DNA, we then design a new primer that matches the last part of the 300 nucleotides and read the sequence again from that point onward. We repeat this process to read the entire sequence. A slightly different method for genome sequencing is hierarchical shotgun sequencing, where we break the genome into larger pieces than we do in whole genome shotgun sequencing. These pieces are larger than a plasmid or bacteriophage can accommodate, so we clone them into bacterial artificial chromosomes. Using restriction enzyme fingerprinting, we can identify the order of these large fragments on the genome. This process is called chromosome walking. We can then go ahead and sequence each back like we would in whole genome shotgun sequencing. But now instead of trying to assemble the entire genome from the sequencing reads, we solve a much smaller puzzle and assemble each back separately. The backs are then assembled to form the genome sequence. Sequencing was used at a large scale in early 1990s. In 1991, expressed sequence tags were sequenced in order to discover the genes in a genome. This involved reverse transcribing the messenger RNAs into complementary DNAs, which were then sequenced. In 1995, whole genome sequencing was used to sequence the genome of the Haemophilus influenzae bacteria, which has about 2 million bases, and the Mycoplasma genitalium, which has a genome size of about half a million bases. Over the next several years, genomes of larger and larger organisms were sequenced, leading to the publication of the first draft of the human genome in the year 2000. I need to stress that that was a draft because there were many missing parts. Human genome is continually being sequenced and analyzed to produce a more comprehensive and accurate genome sequence. Since the human genome sequencing, the genomes of many other organisms have been sequenced. Now that we have these genomes available, we have been asking new questions, such as, which genes are being expressed and by how much? The answers to such questions do not require a genome assembly, but instead requires us to map the reads onto an already sequenced genome. Sanger sequencing, while still being the gold standard for genome sequencing, is too labor-intensive and inefficient for such applications. Next-gen sequencing is a term that is used to describe methods that are high-throughput and massively parallel. These methods produce shorter, less accurate reads. 
there is more computational work required to work with these smaller, noisy puzzle pieces. The pyro sequencing method is designed to produce a light signal every time a new nucleotide is added during the DNA synthesis. A pyrophosphate is released when the polymerase enzyme adds a new nucleotide. This pyrophosphate is converted to ATP by ATP sulfurylase, which is then used by the luciferase enzyme to produce light. During DNA synthesis, each of the four types of nucleotides are added one by one. The nucleotide that produces a light signal is the one that has just been added to the DNA and is complementary to the DNA we are trying to read. Instead of running the reaction in a tube like in Sanger sequencing, the pyro sequencing method uses a solid microarray where many different fragments are attached and can be sequenced in parallel by monitoring the light produced from each microarray cell. Pyro sequencing produces reads that are up to 250 bases long and it can sequence a 100 megabase sequence with 99.5% accuracy. A drawback of pyrosequencing is that it is bad at judging the length of the homopolymer runs. For example, if the sequence contains a continuous sequence of adenines, pyrosequencing cannot tell exactly how many adenines there are. Pyrosequencing was marketed by 454 Life Sciences, which was acquired by Roche, which discontinued it in 2015 because it wasn't competitive enough compared to other technologies. Illumina sequencing uses the same sequencing by synthesis strategy as Sanger. The main difference is that a flow cell is used where millions of DNA fragments are immobilized. The fluorescent signals produced by the incorporated nucleotides are detected directly in real time, so there is no need to do size separation of fragments using chromatography. Instead of chain terminating nucleotides, Illumina uses regular nucleotides that are dye labeled. The dye prevents another nucleotide from being added. After a nucleotide is added and the fluorescence is measured, the dye is washed off and the next nucleotide is incorporated. Illumina sequencing produces reads about 150 bases long, but can read billions of fragments in each run, producing close to 1 terabases of sequences per run, with 98% accuracy. The solid method, developed and marketed by Applied Biosystems, uses ligation where a longer probe is ligated to the DNA as opposed to sequencing by synthesis where one nucleotide is added at a time. The probes that are being ligated are fluorescently labeled so that when a probe is incorporated, we can detect which probe it is from its fluorescence label. The probes are colored to indicate the identity of only the first nucleotide, so we only get to know one of the nucleotides for each probe being added. The fluorescent label is then cleaved and ligation with probes is repeated until the entire fragment is produced. Then the DNA is denatured for another round of ligations using a longer primer so we can read the next set of nucleotides. A higher density sequencing array is used to read sequences in parallel. Solid method produces about 100 bases per read and a total of 60 gigabases per run. The reads produced by SOLID are 99.94% accurate. For comparison, Sanger's chain termination method is 99.999% accurate. Sanger's method, however, is not scalable to produce as many reads, so it would take more time and cost more to use Sanger's method. In summary, the first generation of DNA sequencing methods were Sanger's sequencing by synthesis method and Moxham and Gilbert's sequencing by degradation method. Sanger's sequencing method has been improved over time to make it more efficient, 
and currently is the most accurate sequencing method available. Because of its accuracy, Sanger's method has been used in genome sequencing projects. The focus in the next gen sequencing methods is to produce many fragments simultaneously while sacrificing some of the accuracy. This sacrifice can be overcome computationally by inferring and removing the errors. Also, the types of applications that next-gen sequencing is used in are forgiving of such errors, because a higher quality reference genome is already available and can be compared to. The technologies used for next-gen sequencing observe synthesis or ligation in place, without having to separate the fragments by size. Pyrosequencing designs the synthesis so that light is produced for each nucleotide being added. Illumina uses reversible chain termination nucleotides, and Solid uses sequencing by ligation. These technologies are continually being improved, and new methods are being developed to increase the length, accuracy, and the scale of the reads.